I'm joined now by two very well-known directors, one of stage, one of screen, Gary Hines, co-founder of Druid Theatre, director, Tony Award winner, the first female to do so for the Beauty Queen of Lunan, director of the critically acclaimed Druid Singh and recipient of so many honours, including an honorary doctor from NUIG and Freedom of the City of Galway. Not bad for a Roscommon woman. Uh, by the way, the last play that I did see before lockdown in this country was at The Beacon. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, huge success. Thank you. Lenny Abramson, uh, film director, screenwriter, and probably now best known for normal people. But of course, there are so many others that we could mention. Room, Adam and Paul, Frank, and Garage. Thank you both for joining me here today. Uh, IDA goes out and tells the story of Ireland uh, to the world, uh, what we're about and what we're trying to, to do. And I thought, who better to have with us than people who tell stories uh, for a living. And I, I want to get to that in a moment. But I want to start, I guess, and have to start with the past year and uh, how it's been for uh, you both. So, um, Gary, you and I have had uh, an opportunity to discuss previously just how difficult it is in the world of theatre on a, a normal day. Yeah. How has it been for the past year? Well, it's, it, it has been extraordinarily difficult as it is for everyone. I've often said that if you wanted to invent something that would instantly shut down live theatre, you couldn't have invented anything better than COVID because uh, theatre depends on people's closeness. It depends on uh, the audience and the actor being together, breathing together in the one space. And of course, uh, therefore, Throughout the, lo the uh, uh, lockdowns, there's been no theatre. We, 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 we can't do anything. But Druid, we were just very anxious to get out to our audience and to perform to our audience directly live as soon as possible. And we uh, created this project which performed in Cool Park called Druid Gregory. And it was um, a staging of a number of our plays and reflections on our life. So that went out in September, October and toured to audiences around Galway. And uh, it, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, and probably made all the more wonderful because we had never before any of us been deprived of the ability to actually do the thing that we do, which is make theatre. And suddenly here after six months, we, we were allowed to do it. And, and uh, I think we learned to value it all the more for, for the experience of do, losing it. Do you think that the experience of COVID will have longer term impacts on theatre in terms of the way you do things and how you think about things and interaction with the audience? Yes, I think they will. I mean, in the sense that all theatres, I think, have become very creative, for instance, in using other media like live streaming um, and extraordinarily inventive in what people have done uh, outside their usual um, ways of doing things. And I think some, some of that, not some of that, but that sort of uh, finding new ways of doing things that will that will stay, I think, beyond even when we're we're back in live theatre. But I don't think the essence of live theatre will ever change. I, 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 the, the congregation of people together in the one room uh, or in the one field, whatever, um, is, is um, well, you know, um, without overstating, it's, it's sort of sacred and, yeah. and uh, that will not change. So the, the co-location, uh, the experience is what's important. Yeah. Um, Linny, I'm sure it's been equally challenging uh, at your end. Um, and of course, in the middle of all of this, we've had normal people, which has brought enormous success. So congratulations mm -hmm. on that. How has that been working uh, through all of that in the middle of a lockdown? I think we all felt very lucky because we finished the last post-production parts of normal people actually in lockdown with everybody in their own places and all the kind of machinery that would normally be in a post-production facility all sort of um, distributed around houses. And it man we managed to, to finish it. But I think had lockdown happened a few weeks earlier, we wouldn't have. So very lucky to have finished it. And then it was a nice counterpoint to the, um, to the anxiety and the kind of preoccupation of, of the pandemic to have this thing go out into the world. And, and, and probably to an extent because of 
um, people's state of mind in the pandemic to have it resonate the way it did with an audience. So that was very positive. I think generally speaking, um, film hasn't been as badly affected as theatre because you know we don't have a, a live audience in the same way we do in the cinema. And that's the part. The theatres have been sort of shut down, the, 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 the movie theatres. But we, we have other ways of getting, there are other ways of getting your work to an audience, primarily television, but streaming movies as well. And so there's been a way of of continuing the conversation. But I think that the, the experience of the cinema for me is such a kind of big thing. And, and I haven't really been able to think about, you know, I'm glad I've been working in television for the last little while, but it, it makes me very anxious to, to sort of think of what life would be like if you couldn't go into that dark room and, and be with other people and, and, and collectively watch a, a film. Uh, I suppose when, when Idea goes out and is selling Ireland to uh, investors, one of those things that we are selling kind of subliminally, I guess, is the creativity, the culture, the arts that exist in Ireland that attracts uh, people to Ireland, that attracts people to the Irish. Do we value that enough? Do, are we doing enough to replenish the well, so to speak, of where that comes from, Gary? Well, I mean, I think in, in answering this question, you've got to say before and after. Um, if you were asking me before the pandemic, I would have said no. Now, in the course of it, I won't say, yes, definitely, we are recognising, but there is a greater recognition. And um, the recognition by the government, the extra funding, the stabilisation funding. Uh, recently, the Arts Council uh, gave, um, I don't know how many, 100 bursaries to individual artists, that somehow or other, these dire conditions have actually woken up to people to the fact that this is something that's fragile and that could go away if we're not careful. And I can only hope that that awareness is going to continue. Do you think uh, that all of the experience of the last 12 months has, has raised people's consciousness of the arts and, and what it means and, and the value that they place on it? I, I, I hope it has. Mm. Uh, we won't know for sure that it has. The, it definitely has in, in the context of the pandemic. But in terms of um, the sort of uh, lifelong sort of nurturing of the actor or the artist or the director or the designer or the technical crew and the notion that this is a life that encompasses families and long term living and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it's going to take a couple of years to see will that sustain post post the, the conditions of now. And of course, that, that's a great point, Lini. I mean, we often see the talent, the person on stage or maybe the person on screen, but there are so many people behind the scenes making all of this happen. And it has been a very difficult time over the last period for those. Are we doing enough, I suppose, to replenish that well as well and, and, and maintain what we have already, the fabric of the, these industries? I mean, I think we, we're good at crisis management and we have, I was involved in one of the uh, task forces in the Arts Council to make recommendations and I was pleased that a lot of those recommendations and uh, by other groups also were taken on board but I'm not sure if we and uh, like Gary I really hope we recognize that um, the arts in a way were the kind of patient with a pre-existing condition prior to going into the pandemic you know we, we people love what they do in the arts and that goes from people in front of the camera all the way through and on the stage all the way through to everybody all the technicians and and front of house people but you can't expect people to sort of um deal with the level of precariousness that goes with that life very often and unfortunately um you know as as uh, uh, Gary said, through through an entire working life where you have families to consider as well. So I think, you know, the arts were already in a fragile situation. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that a, a lot of sort of supporting structures were put in place. But I think they, you know, versions of that need to remain in place to, to make the arts kind of robust. Otherwise... Um, you won't get the kind of work that is so meaningful to people and the meaning of which becomes so apparent in a time of crisis. I mean, I think film and television in a way got the best of um, the supports over the last couple of decades because 
um, the film board has been around for quite a while now and that's been a consistent level of support. Um, and because there were, you know, because it's quite a high profile thing and there have been some successes, I think there was a kind of recognition to some extent of the kind of value of that in, in our, you know, for Ireland's kind of global um, presence. But I think it's a huge mistake if you don't recognize firstly how much the entire ecosystem of the arts contributes to each one of the arts. Like there are no actors on film if there aren't actors who start acting on stage or, you know, or move between the two. It shouldn't be a, there's no um, uh, sort of, there's no clear boundary between arts, people who paint or who design can design within theater or within film. So the whole thing has to stand or fall together. And I hope, I also think there's a massive opportunity to, um, that has yet been untapped in terms of the sorts of the level of work that could be made here, the number of people who could be involved. Um, we don't have enough in the way of uh, studio space for filming. We don't have the kind of degree of support for theatre companies that's consistent and, you know, doesn't just come and go with particular projects outside of a few key, key theatre companies. So there are lots of things that we could do better. And I just hope we don't return post-pandemic to a kind of life support system uh, approach to the arts. Yeah, I think it's really important that uh, we don't return. And, you know, it sounds perhaps a bit arrogant, but that we ourselves play a part in not letting it return. Because now that uh, it's been acknowledged that, that you know, if there's no theatre, people have no work and people are literally trying to bring up families all of that is laid, has been exposed, if you like. So there's no excuse anymore to say, I didn't know, or I don't understand, or isn't it something you do for the love of it, and so on. It's clear now what it is. It's a professional sector requiring professional support. And so there is no reason, uh, um, I think, for us to be able to ignore that. So you see this as a watershed moment, essentially? I, I do, yeah. I have to see it as a watershed moment. OK. Um, Moving to the art of storytelling, um, which is, uh, as I said, something that we tried to do in IDA, but, but I now have two professionals in front of me. So what, what is the secret to the art of uh, storytelling? And when do you know that you have it? Uh, that is there a point where you say, that's, that's what, uh, how I'm going to, to, to do this and, and lay this out for the audience, whomever that audience may be? I'll start with you, Gary, and I'm going to give the same question to Lenny. Well, I suppose it's probably different between us. I mean, you don't ever know that's it until you have that critical encounter with the audience. Mm. So you can have a fabulous time in a rehearsal room for three or four weeks. You, you think everything you're doing is wonderful, that everybody is wonderful. You go in front of an audience and blank. So it's not wonderful. So really the time when the story, uh, I was saying in, in another context that there are three times I hear a play crystal clear. The first time is when I read it for the first time, discover it, so to speak. The second time is when I hear it read by actors. And the third time is when I hear it uh, performed by actors in front of an audience. And those three times are, are always crystal clear. And that's very interesting because one of the things I was going to ask you was, you know, is is it, I suppose, the the story itself, the content, is it in the delivery or is it, you know, the interaction between yourself and the audience? And you've actually mentioned kind of those three things. It's, you know, it's the script, it's the uh, the, the um, actors performing it and then the audience. So is it all three that... Oh, very much so. Yeah, in the theatre, like if you look at, for instance, say the storytelling of somebody like Brian Friel, uh, and you look at something like Dancing at Lunasa, um, you know, he created extraordinary characters and an extraordinary story, but then it's the structure of how he told that story. I mean, originally, uh, it, it, it was the story of his two aunts. Mm. Uh, and you can see that now in the play, but the play emerged not as a story about two ants, but an entirely different one. And so they, they're all part of it, structure, character, action, dialogue, everything, everything has to come together. Mm. 
Lenny, same question to you, I guess. You know, what do you think is the essence of it? And I, I suppose what's interesting to me is once once you have seen something, uh, it, it's difficult to envisage it told a different way. So I'm thinking of Room, for instance. I can't imagine how that story could be told differently to how how you've actually kind of directed it. But, you know, is um, is there another way? And could you tell oh, that a different way? There are always multiple ways, I think. And part of what you hope is that when that encounter happens with the audience, it will feel like it couldn't have been any other way, you know, even though you can see where the decisions were made and where the kind of scaffolding is. And, um, and for example, with Room, there was quite a strong, I think, sense among the executives involved who were all very positive, there was no bad sort of pressure or anything, that we would really need to intercut the two halves of the story, that you wouldn't be able to put the, exactly, you wouldn't be able to put the, the climax in the middle. You know, because that doesn't that goes against the sort of more conventional storytelling kind of rules. Um, and so it was really the, the, our instinct was that you could, but that you had to sort of begin a new story very subtly in the second half. And and the, the really tricky part of that was to hold the audience at the sort of I kind of think of it at the apex of throwing the ball in the air when motion stops. And then how do you sort of hold them and gather the momentum into the second part? For me, there's no kind of there's just, I try to encounter the thing as kind of honestly as I can. Um, and I think that the thing that storytellers probably have is just a, maybe a, a, a sort of developed version of what everybody has, which is a sense of the other person that they're speaking to, you know, the capacity to imagine yourself on the other side of it, like watching it or being present for it and, um, and, and, and understanding how attention works or, you know, and how tension is created and a lot of very instinctual things. But but the, the, the thing I often go back to is just, and I, and I always say this about, like when people tell you there are rules, and I think less so in theater, but in film, there is this conception that there is a way of a three act structure and a particular, you know, by page 20, such and such an amount of action should have occurred or whatever. I would say, well, the, you know, if you're sitting with somebody in a bar who's a good storyteller and they're telling you something about their lives or what happened the day before, all that matters is that you want to keep listening. There are no rules. It's just the being feeling compelled to know what happens next. And that could be a tiny thing or a very, you know, um, dramatic thing. But whatever it is, is that sort of thread that that holds you with a good storyteller. And it's either there or it, or it isn't. I, I guess in our case, we're often telling um, an evolving story because obviously Ireland isn't static. Uh, you know, what we're trying to sell isn't uh, static. And we do, I suppose, find ourselves reimagining maybe the same uh, story several different ways or versions of it. And um, again, how do you approach something like that? I'm thinking of Druid Singh, uh, Gary. How do you approach, you know, looking at something kind of afresh and bringing it uh, to life? Well, in the case of Druid Singh, while, while the company had done productions of uh, Singh's works before, we had never done all of them and we had never done all of them together. So that immediately opened up a new way of looking at these plays, like by definition, um, in the sense that, the, that we as, as the people who are creating the production we're, we're having to create the plays in the context of a six hour story being told through the plays and the audience themselves were in the process of watching something that lasted six hours. You know, they were all in the same room. So that became, if you like, the story of Druid Singh. And Linny, I guess um, one of the things that strikes me about um, some of your work is, um, you know, we mentioned Room, but, you know, Frank or Garage there, uh, the stories themselves are quite unusual, uh, you know, so they, they, they are probably engaging in it itself. Uh, how do you do justice to a story like that and make sure that, you know, you, you, you deliver it in the way that does it justice? I mean, each one is different and, and requires, I think, a different, it's like taking the temperature of it and kind of, Tone is a big thing. No, knowing, you know, knowing what it should feel like, it, 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 like when you're watching it. Um, but but say something like Garage, which you have really is a tiny event, but one which is catastrophic for the character. 
And it's about, you know, where do you start that story? Is Mark O'Halloran is a brilliant writer who wrote both that and Adam and Paul. It's the question we would discuss, like, oh, so for how far back from that do we start? Where do we, how do we approach this thing? We knew what the central event was um, and we had a sense of who the character was. But, but then it's kind of, you know, it's about, it's, it's, it's creating the journey towards that kind of cathartic moment in the, in the story. And we felt that by kind of understanding the cycles of this character's day, the repetition, the circularity of it, you'd feel the interruption um, in a really interesting way. So that, that's that with Frank is a totally sort of, it's a bizarre confection um, and, and it allows itself to be kind of heightened in places. But what I, I tend to try to do is, um, the, leaving Frank aside, but the more extreme the, the, the kind of story is or the more um, uh, dramatic the central event is, the more I'm trying to make it feel like it really is happening on a on a Tuesday afternoon in a real place, because going the other way, like being tempted to sort of exaggerate the strongest aspects of a story, often leads to a sort of hyper hyperbole. So sometimes by going against that and being you know incredibly grounded in how you tell the story, is the way to make something shocking. That you know, and I, you know, so it, the, there's just a sort of I, I don't know. I always think about um, it, my mum had a friend who used to tell terrible stories. No, she was just the world's worst storyteller. And she'd say things like, well, we were in the restaurant and waiter came, gave her order. It was great. We chose. She had the steak. I had the lasagna. It arrived. The lasagna was delicious and the steak was a little bit overcooked. That would be the story. And you just go, but you set it up with so much deliberate sort of slowness that you can only do that if you've got a really great <laughs> punchline, you know? <laughs> good, good, good to remember that, I think. Uh, listen, we, we started the conversation with, um, I suppose, the year that uh, was, um, maybe looking forward, uh, Linnea, I know you're uh, about to, to go on location filming. Are you optimistic for 2021? Yeah, I am optimistic. I mean, I'm not an optimist generally, you know, but 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 if I but but in terms of like the headlines, I think that 2021 will be, you know, meteor striking the earth notwithstanding better than 2020, you know, it looks like we'll be back in front of audiences. It looks like the the vaccines on the way and and I'm you know, I'm I'm amazed by it's like like Gary was saying about the ingenuity and the creativity of people in theater. It's been the same almost immediately people find ways to shoot things you know there's just there's just got to always be a way and um i'm in the midst of prep on something and you know it's just it, somehow we you get to do it and you manage to make it work and yeah i am i am positive about it and i think i also think there's such a huge appetite it's like holding everybody's been sort of held back for months and I think when you let that go, yeah. there's just a massive amount of energy to, to come out in the next year. Yeah, absolutely. Gary, optimistic no. for 21? Oh, yes, ab absolutely optimistic. And it's the same thing. It's this sense of energy held back that, you know, needs to. So, I mean, we're we're constantly planning. The only thing is in this state, the only thing that's different is you have to constantly plan, then replan, then replan. So you don't have just a plan A and plan B, you have C, D, E, whatever. So, uh, you know, but I think things are in the last couple of weeks alone, just things are looking better. And, and, um, We'll have exhausted the alphabet, but we'll have survived. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well put. Gary Hines, Linnea Wilson, thank you so much for joining IDA today. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you. Thank you.